two, one, two, three, go. Man to heart. I said, man to heart. This is the sound of Jude, a young person with vision impairment, also known as VI, playing percussion plays drums. Jude was one of a number of young people who attended an event at the Royal Society for Blind Children's headquarters in London, where percussion play brought its instruments as part of its research into making them more inclusive. Hey, well done. <laughs> Percussion Play held two sessions at the Life Without Limits Centre, speaking with young people and their parents and carers. They were asked how the instruments could be made more accessible, whether certain finishes and colours might make the instruments easier to play. George, who is 14, is a regular at the Life Without Limits Centre, and he and his mum, Claire Croft, came along. So what could make this instrument better? How could it be more accessible? Uh, nothing, really. It's all, for, it's all particularly good. I, I can't fault them on anything. I think from a VI point of view, it's brilliant because you've got the beaters attached to it as well. So actually, to me, I think it's really accessible. And you saw George just picks them up and just gets on with it straight away. Um, so what's your name and who have you got with you? Uh, my name's Chloe Alder and I've got Huxley Vickery with me today. And is he musical in any way? Does he like, gravitate towards music? Yes, definitely. Yeah, he loves listening to music, he loves singing, um, and he likes, yeah, he loves playing musical instruments as well. Um, so today he's exploring all the different instruments from percussion play. What's been his favourite? Huxley, what's, what's been the instrument that you like the best today? Which one? The spinning one. The spinning one. The one you can, someone's playing on it now, aren't they? The cyclone. That's definitely a favourite, the cyclone. It makes a big noise, doesn't it? Why is it a favourite? Lots of children like it. They like playing on it, just like you. Owain, who you heard at the beginning helping Jude with drumming, outlines the benefits of playing music in an outside environment and why it can give people with vision impairment the confidence to really experiment and discover music making. So my name is Owain Robinson and I am a senior community support worker for the community services team at the Royal Society for Blind Children. So the two sessions were absolutely fantastic. Um, the great guys from Percussion Play came in um, with a load of their instruments to showcase them to um, a group of young people that we were working with. Uh, all of the young people had some varying form of vision impairment and the age range was quite broad. Um, we had young people from the age of around nine and 10, all the way up to around 16, 17. Um, and both the sessions were brilliant. One was done inside our creative suite where we'd um, sort of set up an exhibition where all the young people could uh, engage with the instruments that you guys had made. They could play around on them. They had free reign to really experiment with them. Um, and then the second one we decided, because it was sunny, we'd have all the instruments outside the front of our building. Um, so it was right by the River Thames. Um, the young people could come in and the parents were allowed to come in as well. And similar as it was inside the building, but it being outside and being a bit more fresh air, there was a lot more of a loose kind of... I don't know, like experimental vibe with it. So the kids were able to really kind of get their fingers stuck in, really try things out. Um, and both sessions were absolutely fantastic. I think for a lot of parents, particularly who came, uh, bringing up a young person with a vision impairment, the idea of engaging with music or learning an instrument immediately seems to be a hell of a lot more barriers, loads more barriers than there would be, you know, like with a normal sighted, abled young person. So I think it was really, really lovely for them to just have a zone and a space where young people could just discover the instruments for themselves in their own time. Uh, there was no pressure. And because the instruments are very new as well, they've never really been seen before. So um, it felt like there was no pressure for the young people or the parents to get it or to be good at it. It was all about just experimenting with it and trying it out. And the instruments themselves were absolutely fantastic. Um, it was a lot more, it wasn't very strict, you know, um, in most instruments like a guitar or a bass or a trumpet. Where to start, uh, there's so many things to learn and notation and reading music. And, but the instruments weren't like that. They were, you know, very, very obvious. They were very, very sensory. They were simple to use. And I think that was the biggest thing for our young people because the young people that we had there, some of them play piano, some of them play violin. Um, some of them, I think we had one young person who um, was doing like Caribbean oil, oil drumming them coming from that experience to it was a great change because it was a lot less rigid. Um, it was a lot more creative, a lot more free. And for the other young people that hadn't ever played an instrument before, it was a really brilliant opportunity um, to get like an introduction into a musical percussive tool um, that otherwise 
they might not have done or they might have been too anxious to do or if they were in mainstream education they probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to do regardless so it was a really fantastic thing to be a part of i think the biggest part of any creative activity let alone a musical activity being outdoors is number one it's so much more of a calming space um there's a lot less pressure uh it's almost therapeutic i think for a young person to be able to just be outside and you know not just being solely involved in the sounds and noises that they're making but to perceive the other sounds around them as well and i think that stimulates them you know i, I do think if they were going to be in a music studio sometimes these music studios have got sound walls that dampen the sound and it can be a lot of pressure for any young person particularly with a vision impairment to be in that environment so being outside is more welcoming it's more freeing it's a lot more relaxed and i think that really helps and encourages the young people to engage with it give it a try you know attempt to actually kind of experiment with the different sounds you know it for them i feel i feel that they feel it's not as much pressure they don't have to be there and they don't have to be making the next Mozart symphony they can just be there in the moment and experiment with the sounds and you know and I think sometimes the ambient white noise that comes around from being outside sort of encourages that creativity and alleviates that pressure like I was saying before learning any instrument can seem like a hugely daunting task um, and there's hundreds and hundreds of years of professional experience with an instrument and I think when any young person regardless of whether they've got a vision impairment or a hearing impairment approaching music and approaching an instrument can seem such a huge big commitment and that in itself I think sometimes throw a lot of young people from engaging musically and creatively um, as they're sort of developing in those educational stages but the instruments from percussion play are just as much about play and exploration as they are actual but actually about music um, there are some instruments which have got three different drums. There are some which riff off of metal bars and sounds and echoes and acoustics. And I think the most important thing about those instruments is it's just completely accessible for, you know, any young person, you know, regardless of how their age is, how old they are, their experience with instruments or their experience with music. It's just a device. It's a tool to help them explore their creativity and their relationship with music. Um, and I just think it was fantastic. I, I think there should be at least seven of them in every single school in the country. Um, I think the best thing about it as well is it's so much more immediate, like a young person can just approach one of these instruments and immediately experiment with it. And like I said, there's no pressure to be great at it. The whole thing about it is being creative and exploring the different sounds you get and letting the child express themselves musically. And I think the earlier that happens into a child's sort of musical or creative development, the better. Um, I think it helps them engage. It doesn't make them feel daunted or like they have to be overly committed to the instrument. It's just there and it's visceral and it's open and, you know, they can just get stuck in. There's no pressure. There's no perfect score mark and there's no failure mark. It's just there and it's perfect for them. The research that Percussion Play undertook has been collated into a white paper, The Sounds of Progress. The research found a number of factors that should be considered when designing outdoor musical instruments. These factors include the positioning of the instruments, what height certain parts of the instruments are and where they are placed, the size of the beaters and how tactile and interesting textures could be incorporated to support inclusive play. Several responses from young people with VI emphasised the role of colour, contrast and reflectivity or shiny surfaces. We brought together the RSBC's CEO, Julie Davis, and Percussion Play's co-founder and CEO, Jodie Ashfield, to discuss the benefits of this research and what impact this project can have in making play more inclusive. Jodie, can you just explain a bit about the genesis of the project um, and partnership with the RSBC? Okay, well, the, the origins really um, started out with um, a holiday. Uh, in York with my family, where I saw a sort of fantastic, uh, or what I what I perceived to be a fantastic piece of uh, public signage, which obviously had a lot of thought gone into it, and it was sort of engraved, and it was it was, it was like an engraved map of the city um, with various different textures and and uh, and shapes and, and what have you, and it was it was quite clearly designed for VR users. So it appeared to me, or rather, it occurred to me that we had a fantastic range of products which we think um, and uh, we've, we've had a lot of feedback that are very inclusive 
although they're sort of more accidentally inclusive rather than being inclusive by design. And so I thought we need to start doing a bit more work and a bit more research but rather than just sort of appear, appealing to a sort of mass market. We need to we need to think about sort of you know, VR users, users that are you know, impaired hearing, um, you know, and, and other additional needs or needs that may be somewhat different to the general population. Yeah, so that's sort of how it came about. And then we sort of started talking about it and thought, you know, perhaps we should reach out to the RSBC and, um, and, and see if we could potentially work in partnership with them to consider, um, you know, the needs of their members. The RSBC kindly invited us um, with their music therapist, the Amber Trust, to host a couple of events. Yeah, so we were delighted to be able to take a range of our instruments to the RSBC Centre and they had invited um, a number of their members to come in over the course of a couple of hours at the event we hosted. Um, and the intention was just to see how their members were able to interact with the products and to sort of gain their, their feedback through a questionnaire on what worked well and what didn't work so well um, in percussion play instruments with the intention of potentially designing a new instrument, at, at, at least one, uh, but also to inform our sort of um, the ongoing sort of continual improvement uh, development process we have here at Percussion Play, how we can sort of um, take the uh, take the information that we that we've sort of gleaned from these these events and and work out how we can improve our products sort of going forward to make them more even more inclusive than they are already. Um, so Julie, you know, music. I think everyone understands music to be an important creative outlet um, for many people with vision impairment. How exciting is it for the RSVC to be collaborating with Percussion Play? It's, it's just such a fabulous opportunity. It was a, a delightful experience from start to finish with great feedback and something we clearly need to do much more of. Um, it really, I, th I think music in particular, it's a, it's a leveller because our children and young people and, and families um, can really access more readily than a lot of other activity. And they absolutely adore it. It's so passionate about it. Um, and it really, you know, when, when you're sight impaired, um, vision impaired, your other senses kick in. And, you know, we've got such talented uh, children and young people. Um, and the creative arts, but especially music, is the one that is probably most in demand um, with with our service users. Um, it, and the other thing I think as well is that we don't settle for just inclusion. What we want is we want our children and young people to do even better. What They shouldn't just keep up with their sighted peers. They should excel and have Aspiration Plus. So it's really important to us that we've got the resources and the partnerships like we have with Amber Trust and with Percussion Play to be able to deliver that richness and, and deliver those opportunities because it's just so impactful. Um, I mean, the centre certainly comes alive as soon as we start playing music, it comes alive and, you know, it really lifts the spirits. And I, you know, part of the research I read in the white paper was about well-being and how critical it is in, in maintaining that and, and improving well-being. Um, you know, I know my children back in the 90s were obsessed with um, a, a thing called Music Box, which was storytelling and classical music brought together. And they absolutely adored it. And my daughter's blind and has been blind since birth. And so I've noticed how critical it is um, in her repertoire of, of, of things to do and, and, and meaningful things that she's engaged with. Um, and we really want to build on our work with with um, Percussion Play and Amber Trust because the creative opportunities for the very, very young right the way through to adolescence and young adulthood because they're just so, so vibrant and, and just just give the young people such a buzz. Thank you, Julie. Um, you mentioned there the white paper. Um, now, Julie, I wondered if you could outline some of the results of, of the research and what is outlined in the white paper. We've got some fantastic feedback um uh, both of the sessions that we held and, and the feedback wasn't just um wasn't just sort of written um and verbal feedback from the, the users but what we were able to observe and um it, it became obvious um from the events that 
whilst there, there are things like textures that we could um, that, that we could add into, for example, uh, some of the notes to, to signify their uh, or to, to identify them by their position. For example, we could add in a rough rough texture on, on even just a, a position on a note, you know, going to a sort of smoother texture to, to allow users to identify by the placement of the note where it would appear in the scale or if it, if it would if it would identify the separation between one octave to another octave for example because it had the same texture we could do that but also really the importance of adding color into the instruments um, because if you're um, uh, registered blind you're not necessarily completely blind you're not necessarily without sight at all and and what i hadn't um, appreciated before that blindness doesn't just doesn't just mean you can't see. Um, you know, the, the, there's a there's a whole uh, there's a whole range of, of visual impairment, we, which means that sort of adding these adding these additional sort of features in um, to, to to the products would make them you know makes them much more accessible than just having sort of you know notes of all exactly the same color and texture, for example. Um, so that was a, that was really fascinating. And one of the other interesting things, uh, and I think really important to highlight is that when not just developing musical instruments, but when designing inclusive play areas, that you need to take into consideration the placement of products within a play area. For example, we have some, some products within our range, which, um, for example, are inspired by nature products, which you know, have the sort of, um, sort of long stems and heads of flowers or bells as part of them. And, if a, if a user, a VR user was, was sort of exploring a play area, you know, using a stick, for example, um, to sort of identify the, the, the base of something or the shape of a, of a, of a product um, when negotiating an area. If you had something that's just sort of uh, a, the head of a bell that's just sort of hanging, hanging randomly in, in space that, but not identified by, or there's no sort of um, delineation between where the playing surface is and, and the, the outline of the equipment, for example, um, that it actually could cause, you know, could, could, could cause the user to sort of collide with an instrument by accident because they were just sort of walking around the, the area and not knowing, you know, what's there. So it didn't necessarily um, inform us that the designs of those products would have to change, but just that as they, if they were included in, or as they're included into play spaces, the, to consider the the location of the, the product and they might need to go on the outside of the play space or they might need to have um you know something around the base of them that would say you know there is there is an obstacle here to be aware of um and uh, it was amazing uh, I, I found it amazing that when you know that these the, the the members that we met at the rsbc some of whom were completely blind and, and others varying degree of visual impairment that as soon as they found an instrument or what was shown to where a specific instrument was that and and uh, and they 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 located the, the mallets or played the instruments by hand they were perfectly perfectly able and and seemingly without any um you know seemingly without any obvious you know disability or lack of ability they just had to know you know where they where they were and what they were what they were doing so Thanks, Jodie. Um, and Julie, you know, how important is it for businesses to recognise the importance of inclusivity? I liked, liked, I liked what you said earlier, you know, about going further than just being inclusive. Yeah, and I suppose there are two aspects to that in that you want sometimes products have to be adapted and improved and enhanced. But equally, we, you don't want it to be that different and stand out. You want people to feel VI um children and young people and, and adults just to feel that they're just alongside their peers and doing something you know typical but it might be something i know in in our kitchen here at the center we have talking microwaves and it just means that you can be independent you can but it, it gives you the instruction as you're pressing and you're touching and it, it's kind of finding that that unique way of including but not being overly different or making it in some way stand out that actually most of our uh, children, young people and families, they just want to blend in. They want to get on with their lives as accessibly as they can. And I suppose in terms of scale, I mean, I was looking up some of the stats that one in five um, people in the UK are 
considered disabled of some kind. And I was looking at, um, they talk about the purple pound and, and the value of disability um, in, in commercial terms. And at the, the current rate, um, and actually it was 2021, was 275 billion. You know, this is not peanuts, you know, to be able to include and just to think, but also I, I was looking at kind of the three things that mattered and it's about being smart and smart products, but it's about staff training to be able to implement it. But the third thing I think for me was don't be an afterthought. It's hard work in terms of design and implementation and cost if you are bolting on things. But if you start with that premise that you want to be inclusive, it's much easier the earlier it is in the, in the design process to be able to get it right and include us to be able to give you that feedback as to what works and what doesn't work. And Jodie's example of maybe the hanging bell of the instrument is an ideal example of if our cane users were scanning with their cane, they wouldn't come across it and they would walk into it. Whereas if there's a slight curb underneath the um, uh, the actual bellhead or the instrument, they would they would scan away and know that it was in front of them. Contrast is very important. Jody's point: only around one in nine, one in ten. Um, vision impaired people are totally blind. The rest have something of some kind, and that could be light awareness. And if you have light, you have some color potentially. So contrast is a huge thing. Tactile and having things that change texture and, and also quite firm because children and young people like things that are quite firm and robust and they know they're not going to give way on them so all of that's really important but I think huge value there but I think as well I was thinking I was thinking of another example of blind Barbie it was an example recently isn't it? you know in, in, in the commercial world and so that kind of was like oh wow you know I've got young girls now and children that can play with blind Barbie I'm sure boys would as well but it's demonstrating as well. So there's twofold there. Our children can identify with that toy because actually they don't see themselves in the world that often. But equally, if we've got sighted children playing with Blind Barbie, we're creating social cohesion as those children grow up. And that's critical to us as well, that our, our children are just accepted as they are. And it's not unusual. It's not that different. We just have to adapt slightly. And children are the best. You know, they don't question, do they? They're born naturally curious and, and want to be friends with everybody. So I think that's really important to us that we've got that cohesion and, you know, that the way that we look at things, how to adapt, but how to remain as mainstream as possible so that we don't disenfranchise people by thinking, oh, we're, we're very, very different. We've got to have something very, very different. Julie, surely, you know, we need more businesses like Percussion Play to be, you know, reflective and thinking about um, their products and, and how they are can be fully inclusive. Um, are you optimistic about the future and, and the, you know, the importance of the Purple Pound and businesses understanding that? I have to be ever the optimist. I think I've got to question about organisations and charities like ours where we say, well, what do we play in that? What part do we play in that process? You know, I, I know that our young people have a manifesto because they want to be able to influence how you travel and, and what transport looks like, um, accessibility mental health and well-being and so on so I've got to be optimistic and if we have to push the buttons of commerce then we have to say well look at the hard facts look at the volume look at the value of these endeavors and the investment by putting the investment in this is what you will gain but also I think that uh, percussion play particularly demonstrate that you can have a mainstream idea that actually can naturally develop into something specific for a, a specific cohort without it being a standout difference. You know, we, we're just sl slight adaptations. It's fully inclusive. And because I want, you know, I talk to my daughter in particular and sometimes she'll say to me, yes, I want to try that new thing. But, you know, I'd like to do it with everybody. I don't just want to do it with people like me necessarily. I want the full experience. So I think that's what percussion play particularly gives us. And so not only do I want, um, 
you know, business to be able to take on the idea that we, we are, you're missing out on a huge customer base, but also thinking how that customer base is um, defined and designed in terms of inclusivity, but with, but with, whilst being um, fairly mainstream at the same time. Thanks, Julie. Um, so, Jodie, I just wanted to end with you and just to ask about, you know, what should we expect to see? You know, we've got the white paper. What are we going to be doing with this research? What can we look forward to seeing from Percussion Play? Well, I just, uh, one of the things I wanted to add in um, to, to something that I hadn't said earlier is, um, and, and Julie just reminded me, about their, their users uh, or, or members um, experiencing things, um, you know, just in, in the general population, is that um, the the second event that we were able to host, um, we were blessed with good weather, and and because of the prominent position of the of the RSBC's life <coughs> life centre, um, it was it, it was uh, it was it was a fantastic day, and we were able to have all of the instruments placed outside. And what I loved was just that that just that members of the public were just passing by, and then we're just kind of like stro strolling into the um, you know strolling into the mix and just having you know play on the instruments as 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 well as all of the the members that had turned up to the um, you know to to the day, and it was um, yeah it's just 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 a fantastic experience to be able to witness that. My dream, Jody, is to have kind of a percussion player orchestra out there. <laughs> On that walkway because the footfall is tremendous we're right opposite the shard and it would be a wonderful place to build inclusion um and develop that we'd obviously love to be involved in that to, to try and to try and make that happen um so what we found out um this this is not a tick box sort of exercise for us and um we wanted to sort of make sure that we had you know, sort of delivered the white paper first, so that we had sort of a, a fully kind of researched, you know, a, a, a good piece of work. And then I think it's important that um, that the next piece of work that we that we complete is um, and something that we'd like some input from the RSBC on um, and that, we'll, that we'll be working on is to try and get this um, a piece of work um, completed, which is um, an, an informative piece to give to our representatives um, and, and the, the um, people that are the reselling these, these products. And it won't just apply to percussion play, it'll apply to, you know, to other, um, you know, other, other manufacturers as well, not just of musical instruments, but of all sorts of play equipment. Um, it's, really, it's really considering uh, VR users in the space and, and placement of equipment and, and, uh, and also the sort of, um, you know, the identification of equipment by, for example, different types of surfacing or different textured surfacing or, you know, raised areas that can do an relation between just a normal walking area and an area that's ha that has equipment in it that you need to be aware of. Um, so because that's something that which, which we can which we can do sort of straight away um, and, and can be rolled out as an informative piece and you know people can sort of start start to hopefully take note of that as they sort of design areas that include outdoor musical instruments. Um, it means that the products don't uh, a, a you know, new, new products that we design um, which do take a long time to design and, and sort of come out into the market they that this, information that we've kind of found out over this this um, this period of time can be sort of rolled out and start to hopefully have an impact in a short space shorter space of time um so that's something that which which we're um which we're, we're planning to work towards um we're working hard on our sort of development schedules um we're definitely planning to um to actually start to roll out some of the um so some of the things we've learned such as texture um to identify specific notes we're planning to roll that out into our products, and we're planning to, to make that happen across our across our product range, rather than specifically coming out with a new product or, or multiple new products that you know are, are designed through the or, or because of the um, information that we found out. And the reason there isn't a specific new product um, at the moment is because what we what we identified or what we experienced was that um, you know blind uh, or, or VR users. They, they're incredibly able to just, you know, and, and, and adapted to, to, to being able to, you know, experience these products in, in uh, just a normal way, you know, not, you know, no, no different to, 
you know any um, you know sighted uh, players they you know once once they know where the notes are and they've got a pair of beats in their hand they could just you know just just play and um, what I was expecting to what I was expecting to to experience and what I experienced were very very different what I was expecting to experience was that you know we would need to make big changes in, in our you know in our designs going forward. Um, and what I found out is that we actually probably only need to make subtle changes, which we can roll out across our existing product range, which um, which will just enhance the inclusivity. That the, it, exactly that just sums up this the subtlety of what could be required, but also the lack of fear. You know, our children and young people and their families just go for it. Um, and they're so ecstatic when they can, if they know they're in a safe environment and the product is safe and of high quality and they can have some fun, just like everybody else. And it would be great to see a percussion play in every playground up and down the country or just so that they can join in and feel that they're a part of it. And that goes for other disabilities, too, that if you're, you know, you're wheelchair bound and, you know, a lot of our children have multiple disabilities. It isn't just the one. So we're able then to really fully include them in the whole process um but it's great news that you know a you're thinking of design right from the start but also thinking do you know what we don't have to completely start from scratch because what we've got is a really good solid product that we can enhance and it like i say it, the minimum of of, uh, of change um can actually bring it alive for you know and be really inclusive for you know, our cohort of, of blind children and, and young people. Percussion Play hopes this research will drive inclusivity in the play industry and they look forward to seeing how their instruments can be enjoyed by everyone everywhere. To read this white paper and to discover more research from Percussion Play, head to our website, percussionplay.com.